What's up everyone, Tom from the Airsoft Headquarters and welcome back. Today we're going to be going in depth with the Elite Force Avalon series. Ooh. Now this is just going to be about the Avalon CQV. Unfortunately, I do not have the full length or the carbine length available uh, just because due to COVID-19 situation, not able to get any into the store. However, I do have the CQB Sabre in both the black and the bronze coloration. So I have these available. We're going to be just talking about them, going over them, as well as doing a chrono and a shooting review. So let's get into it. Right at the top, we do have a bright orange, fairly large orange flash suppressor that is actually coned on the inside here. So it actually acts as a amplifier for all of the BBs that are escaping. So it actually makes a louder pop sound. So going backwards, we do have some flip down iron sights. Now the weird thing is that these guys are not a push down or pop up. There is a button that sits on the side here that are spring assisted upwards. So you do have to press that button if you want those popped up or press them in to push them back down. Otherwise these do break if you try to force them up or down. Uh, just something to keep in mind. These are completely adjustable as far as windage and elevation as well. So you can use these iron sights competently if you feel like you are able to. Obviously we do have the more traditional uh, M4 style of CQB handguard that is available in M-Lock just on the three, six and nine o'clock positions. The very top length here is going to be all picket tinny. Obviously this is going to what makes the Sabre series, the Sabre series. Um, but previously Elite Force or Avalon was coming out with the Caliber series, which was a 416 clone that was officially unlicensed, but it had a key mod rail segment instead of the more common uh, Picatinny 416 style. The calibers are discontinued, so just the sabers are being produced for the Avalon series. And of course, uh, they are coming out with even more rifles in the near future. But for the Sabre CQB, we do have a 10 inch barrel length setup, 10 inch or a nine inch barrel, excuse me, since the threads do secrete a little bit farther in uh, compared to the very end of the rail system. So you do have that pretty cool if you did have a mock suppressor like on this guy back here, uh, you can have that seated inwards if you did want to have that, want to have that integrally or the, if you did want to have the integrated mock suppressor look to it. And then on the side here, the left and the right is going to be a quick detach sling plate option. If you did want to have anything forward mounted as far as a sling option, pretty cool that that's included. I see, I see the uh, sling mounts included more and more with more models coming out every year. Uh, just cool to have a option to mount slings instead of having to get the attachments, in this case, get the accessories to mount that sling attachment in order to do that forward sling instead of just having a quick detach. Cool that Avalon was doing that some years ago. Going downwards is going to be a reinforced aluminum receiver. I wouldn't say that this is heavy. It's not on the light end either. I would say it's more on the lightweight side of a full metal receiver and rail system built. So it's still got some heft to it. You know that it's there, but it, and it feels really, really solid. Um, in fact, I've never seen any sort of issues with any of the receivers cracking or have any sort of malfunctions as far as uh, parts not being built up or thick, thick enough, I should say. So from the top, we do have a rotary style pop-up and the imitation bolt does retain backwards when you pull that charging handle backwards, which is a excellent feature. I find myself expecting that feature to be included with every new product that we get in. And so I'm sometimes a little bit uh, disappointed when I find that some rifles don't have that included. I don't know, Avalons are starting to spoil me a little bit. So on the left-hand side, there is the imitation bolt release right there. So as you push that inwards, that bolt or imitation bolt is going to slide forward. Going down from there, we do have a 
very large magazine release button on the right hand side. So grab one of the EPMs here and just hitting that, the EPM slides out. So for left-handed people, they hit that magazine release. Magazine obviously is going to slide out, no issues. There is going to be ambidextrous, safe, semi, and full auto selections. So that is cool that they continued that left and right hand ambidextrous selection. There is a more blade trigger that is more commonly used on airsoft rifles. Eh, that's a standard amount for a trigger pull take up. And then I guess for the Avalons with their QRS, they do have a uh, pointer finger uh, index position or mount right there that is built into the trigger guard. So when you're shooting, 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 and you need to go into a neutral or safe position, that's kind of a indexing point for your trigger, uh, trigger finger to sit against when you are in a safe position. And that's on the left and right hand side, which is a cool feature, not really necessary, but uh, it's a cool feature. And then going backwards, there is going to be the QRS grip here, which has a very cool texturing on the side of here. Um, it's fairly accented, uh, kind of like loose gravel or very uh, thick sand. It's not painful. It's not super gritty when I put my uh, hand against it. And it's only on the left and right hand side of the grip. Um, I like the fact that they have the beaver tail grip extension there. That is super comfortable for me in order to, uh, I guess, be a little bit more comfortable shooting, for me at least. Going back, there is going to be a left hand and a right hand sling plate. For some reason, there are two mounts that are separated by a single bolt. So this is kind of a half moon or a semicircle of a sling mount on the left-hand side for uh, people that are right-handed versus on the right-hand of the rifle for left-handed people, there is just a quarter of a circle for a sling mount. Um, I guess that's a little right-hand biased. And then going backwards, obviously we do have our standard six position stock. Uh, the QRSs are one of the nicer stocks that we at the Airsoft headquarters really like. They do offer a lot of battery space as well as being able to limit the amount of battery space as well. For example, the tubes that your 9.6 volt nickel metal hydride battery would fit against can come off if you decided to run just a standard LiPo inside of the buffer tube. So then when you close all of this, you have a more streamlined, much more slim option of a stock that you can run just your lipos in, making it a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more high speed, low drag type of setup. And then obviously the tubes can get mounted right back into position, assuming that I have the left and right hand side not confused. There we go. There's the left hand side and then the right hand side. And those tubes are retained in place via the uh, back of the stock here, the, the butt of the stock. Um, so those tubes themselves cannot come out. You gotta pull that up and out and then the tubes can come out. What I end up doing is with my LiPo batteries, if I am using like a lithium ion or something like that, um, I usually put the battery itself inside of the buffer tube the wire leads come out just a little bit. So battery connectors come out and obviously they sit right inside of that space there. So I can have my battery sit inside of here, wires connecting on the connector here, which can go flat. Obviously I'm gonna have the stock position in a position or stock in a position that I want that's comfortable for me. And then because of the way that the wires sit up in the back here and that in that 90 degree position, I'm not going to want to rip this back and forth a whole lot. So once I have it where I want it, that's exactly where it stays. And then I have a good point of aim in my shoulder when I do want to get very fast target acquisition. For some reason that I've never been able to figure out, there is Picatinny on the bottom here. Obviously, I know that you can put accessories down there. I know that, 
but for the life of me, I've never been able to figure out like a logical reason why those Picatinny rail systems are down there. Like, I know you can put a grip on there. I'm not going to put a grip on there. I can put a bipod down there, but I, I'm not going to put a bipod down there. You know, I could put a 203 down there, but I'm not going to because that doesn't make sense. So if you guys have a logical attachment that could fit back there, uh, put it down in the comment section below. Let me know what I am missing. Um, another weird thing about these is in order to get the stock all the way off the buffer tube, you actually need to open this, pull the tubes out. There is a pin that sits back here that you would need to pop out. And that would allow the grip here or the button to be pressed all the way flat so you can proceed to pull the stock all the way off. Uh, just a little pro tip for anyone that might be struggling. And then we have a sling mount back here and a little hole that you can run some paragord if you did want to put a sling mount back here. Otherwise, there's no other real specific options for a second sling point to sit against the stock. Overall, fairly solid. If we look at the bronze rifle, it is the exact same setup as far as tip to butt with all of the different accessories and all the different features, however, just coming in a bronze. What is nice is that these are actually a Cerakote finish, which is the exact same type of finish that you would see on real firearms, on professional firearms. So very cool that they actually went and took the extra steps to make sure that it is a good finish and it's a clean finish. Like as I look into the Avalon trades, everything is completely clear. Nothing is kind of built up or uh, too sticky inside of those Avalon trades in order to cover up letters or stuff like that. So very, very cool that this is actually like a professional finish to all of their rifles. I'm a huge fan of that. It looks really, really nice in either the flashy bronze coloring or in the flat black coloration. In fact, I think with the uh, shadows, the trades actually pop a little bit more on the black one compared to the bronze. But very quickly in the comments section below, before we get into the next part, let me know which coloration you think is better of the two black or bronze. I end up finding that players pick up bronze a little bit more than the black coloration, but let me know down below. In the meantime, let's hop over to the corner station and then we'll go do a testing shooting review. All right, here we go. VFC Avalon 0.20s going through the chrono. We saw some right at 400. So maximum of 402 FPS, minimum of 394 for an average of 398. For such a short, compact little rifle, it's putting out quite a pop. Now, something I think is worth mentioning is that this is a 7.4 lithium ion. Let's do rate of fire. 34 rounds per second. Oh no, 12.9 rounds per second, right? I think that's how they map that out. Oh yeah, rounds per second, 12.9, 12.9, 12.8. Cool. 12.913, awesome. Obviously with 11.1, it's going to be a little bit faster, but uh, let's take this back. Obviously, like I said before, having that cone on the end there is going to make the sound snap a little bit uh, as far as a pop as the BB exits the inner barrel. So it is quite intimidating. But now let's go check out the range and accuracy. All right, back here at 25 feet, aiming for the head using day aperture. That's actually really large for a daytime aperture. Headshot, ah, I'm gonna have to do kneeling. I did upper body, I'm feeling a little bit wobble.
All right, kick it out to 100 or 50 feet. Kick it out to 50 feet. And I noticed that all those BBs were dropping, so I'm gonna do some hop-up test. Yeah, that that is low. I felt like those BBs were hitting, impacting low. That's actually pretty good, okay. Now, supported on the body. All right, that was another 10. Aiming for the body. Oh, that was high, so I gotta compensate low. All right. All right, dudes, welcome back to the studio. So, we just got done with the chrono test and we just got done with the accuracy test or consistency test, whatever you wanna call it. And now we're back to look at the results. Overall, really good velocity test as far as going through the chronograph with a 0.20. Fairly consistent as far as an AEG platform. Of course, being restrict restricted based on the uh, cylinder and the piston that naturally come in AEGs, there is going to be a little bit of a spread, but overall, I think that these were very, very consistent, especially with the CQB length, right at 400, in fact, peaking a little bit over, is very, very, very impressive. Now, with the accuracy review that I have in front of me that I'll show you guys as well, is the one discrepancy or the one asterisk I do have to tell you guys about is I did use three O's as far as the weight of BB when doing the testing. With the higher velocity, uh, I figured that with the 0.30, that is going to be a good option for anyone that's doing outdoors that is trying to impact at harder dis or at greater distances uh, uh, within outdoor fields specifically. Also, there was a right to left hand wind um, across that open space that could have been an issue with 0.20s. So just for the sake of retaining some accuracy on paper, I resorted to using a heavier weight BB out at that 100 feet distance. Of course, wind wasn't going to be nearly a disadvantage at 25 or 100 feet since I was indoors and then had the wind blocking with my vehicle. Out at 100 though, we did get to see some inconsistency. I'm going to blame the wind and possibly the shooter just because of shooter inaccuracies. We all know that. Now, one complaint that I do have to say right away is that the iron sights, for me at least, were a little bit of an issue. Now, even though VFC is, or Avalon is going to be some of the better built external and internal components, um, for these iron sights specifically, I did have some issue with uh, looking through the uh, rear aperture in order to get a proper acquisition with the front sight. Uh, for me personally, the front post was too wide on the uh, sides here in order to get a proper idea where my circle is um, in conjunction with that front iron sight post. And so I felt for me, there was a little bit of inaccuracy there, but we're gonna look at the results nonetheless. So 25 feet with a 0 0.30 gram BB, obviously pretty tight grouping. Again, I was aiming for the circle there and at 25 feet, I did not adjust the hop up to uh, have any sort of backspin on the BB. So there is a little bit of drop there about set six, seven inches down from the, uh, from the point of aim, point of impact was low. After that, at the 50 foot, I did adjust the hop up. So we did get way better groupings on the middle of the target on the X using 0.30s. In fact, that's, I would say, only a one inch spread at 50 feet compared to 25 feet. At 50 feet with a 0 0.30, of course, you're gonna re retain consistency, but overall, I think that was really, really, really good results at, at 50 feet. And of course, 
We kicked it out to 100 feet. Like I had said, there is, was a right to left hand uh, wind that I think was a result of a little bit of inconsistencies. It also could be part of the shooter since looking at the spread here, uh, some of the impacts are up towards the 25 foot mark and then several more down below that 50 foot mark for those BB droppings. At 100 feet, I'm not really all that surprised in all honesty. This is a CQB length barrel. And with a 0.30, I figured that the uh, heavier weight would catch up to a higher muzzle velocity with that higher uh, velocity that this is shooting out with a 0.20. So I figured a 0.3 would be a little bit better of an option. However, it looks to be at 100 feet. That seems to be the end all be all with a 0.30 gram BB. I would be interested to redo this test with a 0.28 or even a 0.25 to see what the results could be. Um, of course, that's not gonna be today or tonight. Maybe I'll post that on Instagram or Facebook. You can follow us there. Of course, being a wider spread with a shorter CQB length barrel, you are going to be, get a little bit of inconsistencies. Uh, you are going to get those flyaways just because the BB itself isn't going to have enough barrel length in order to stabilize to get a true straight trajectory. So that is the results of the accuracy test. Overall, impressed. 100 feet, not too surprised in all honesty. Like I had said before, with that inaccuracy, or with the, uh, with the iron sights, I should say, I felt I was having a little bit of uh, inaccuracy or inconsistency with my point of aim. Of course, the stock was out just a little bit for me personally, but that circle just kind of danced around that front sight post, and I didn't have the left and right uh, front iron sight post in order to manage where that circle is floating. If you guys know what I'm talking about, or if you don't, possibly check one of your airsoft rifles and look through the iron sights and look at where the, uh, the circle is compared to that front iron sight post. Uh, but in all honesty, most airsoft players aren't going to be using just iron sights. They're going to pick up some sort of optic or red dot in order to use that. So down those iron sights would go. Of course, I can't, uh, spend too much time on mounting a optic onto this. So iron sights it is. There's a plane flying overhead, fairly low, weird. Anyway, pros and cons about the Avalon rifle. Pro, you are going to get some of the best or better internal and external components for an airsoft rifle. It is essentially pre-built with some of the better components directly out of the box. And that is a, feature that you see all throughout the reviews that you can find online, other YouTubers, people on Reddit, people Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People are just loving the build and performance quality that is out of the box. They don't have to do anything to it. I do have a gearbox here that was pulled from another VFC or Avalon rifle that we can check out the internal components for. Now this was pulled from a rifle that was purchased specifically for an HPA conversion. So we're able to dive right into the gearbox, which was scrapped for that HPA installation. So happy for us, super convenient, uh, especially since I was gonna have to source images or other uh, videos in order to show you what the gearbox looked like, but lucky us. So let's dive into it. So right here we have one of the Avalon gearboxes. I've already undoed, undid the uh, gearbox screws, so save us a little bit of time. Spring guide and spring can come right out. Gearbox shell can flip open, and internally we can look at exactly what's going on. One of the cooler features that you can admire externally is that blade style of trigger. Now there is nothing as far as a assistance or any sort of lead on the trigger itself, so you do have to do full trigger pulls in order to get those trigger contacts to align. Obviously attached to the trigger contacts are going to be a inline style of MOSFET. Ooh, there the trigger popped. Obviously attached to the, uh, the trigger contact is going to be an inline MOSFET that sits on the left side of the gearbox shell. And that is essentially the MOSFET system that is advertised and is 
recommend it for 11.1 .1 use. And as we disassemble everything out, we'll be able to take a closer look at that. So inside here, we have the piston with the pistons, uh, piston head. Uh, in my opinion, the piston head itself really isn't all that great. Um, in my opinion, I usually change these out for something else. Same thing with the piston itself. It is only a half rack. So getting a aftermarket option that is a full rack is going to be a little bit more advantageous. But you can do whatever you want. Having a half rack piston is going to result in a lighter weight, which is going to be a slightly faster trigger response on semi-automatic and a faster rate of fire on full auto. There we go. Piston and piston head. Cylinder is going to be a quarter or one third. I'm assuming this is a quarter as far as the ventilation that is on the gearbox itself or on the uh, cylinder itself. What that allows is for more air to come into the cylinder as the piston slams forward, resulting in, you know, more consistent air volume that is shot forward by the piston. Overall, just a standard cylinder. Uh, myself, I don't change out the pistons or the uh, cylinders at all, just because, you know, they're all just going to be a piece of metal tubing. The cylinder head actually came out fairly loose. Normally those are a little tighter. I need to force them out, but that is still a very, very good seal on the uh, cylinder head itself. In fact, one of the tests that we can do is if we put the piston in, covering this hole with our finger, and that's about as far as I can push forward. I'm forcing it, that is straining against my finger. You can see that pressure and that's where it broke. So even with the stock components, there's a very, very good uh, cylinder compression within all of these components. Again, these are really, really good directly out of the box. For me personally, this is just one thing of the entire gearbox. Well, I take that back. The uh, contacts themselves are a Tamiya. The two things that I change on all of my Avalon or VFC gearbox builds is the contacts and the piston head. That's just me personally. You guys can change or upgrade as much or as little as you want. Set that off to the side. Tap it plate, nothing special. Just a standard tap it plate. Nozzle, nothing special, just a standard nozzle. Inside of the gearbox itself is going to be, of course, your sector gear, which overall, these are very, very heavy. I like the VFCs the best. Of course, these siege tacks are going to be the best brand of gears that you can possibly get. However, the VFCs, excellent options, brand new stock. The uh, bevel gear, again, just a banded, standard VFC. I like these the best. And then the spur gear. VFC as well, one of my favorites. Anti-reversal latch, it's a anti-reversal latch. The tap it plate spring. The trigger, which can come out like so. And then underneath there, we get a little bit better idea as to what is going on with that inline MOSFET. It is essentially a fairly basic inline MOSFET, but it is one of the better ones that is coming stock um, as far as a basic inline MOSFET. There's nothing to program. There's nothing that uh, pre-cocks it, pre-engages anything, does a burst feature, nothing special about it. What is great though, is that there is a lead that leads up or a piece of wire that leads up to the trigger contacts themselves, which is going to not allow the contacts themselves to uh, arc any sort of electricity or current that goes through the wiring system, which results in there not being any sort of burn or scorch marks that happen on the trigger contacts. So these essentially can run 11.1s all day, every day without any sort of issue, which is awesome. Uh, some of the other rifles that I have personally had, 
the 11.1s uh, or some fours that I would use on these, they would arc, which would result in a shit ton of scorch marks or burn residue to build up on those trigger contacts, resulting in, you know, all this residue that prevents the contacts from making any sort of contact. So I couldn't operate the gun. Wacky, right? All of the wiring system in here is going to be a silver base wiring system, which is the nicer stuff. Um, this is going to be the fuse that sits on the wiring system. So if there is, if there is any sort of short or break, then it's just a simple uh, fuse replacement for like 10 cents. You can pick a box of these up, a 20 pack, for like four dollars they're really really inexpensive but for avalons i don't think i've ever had to replace these i've had to on a couple crytex multiple times at crytex anyway that is what we have for all of the avalon internals Whoop. and put that off to the side after that, you're saying, Talon, you went on for a five minute rant about the greatest advantage of having an Avalon series rifle. What could possibly be a single disadvantage to the rifle? Well, I'm glad you asked because one of the biggest complaints that we do see here at the Airsoft headquarters is the price point. Now, this is not going to be just any type of rifle system. This is going to sit more at the higher end price point at $375. And then the full carbine length is sitting right at $400, a little bit pricey. And you honestly get what you pay for. You don't spend a whole lot of money on any sort of licensing or any sort of very specific name brand. All, like all of that $375 goes towards those higher end pre-built internals as well as the external features themselves. Like I said, this is a aluminum receiver and handguard system. These are very, very, very well built. I don't think I've ever seen anyone at any point break the uh, receiver itself accidentally or intentionally. And a lot of times players will actually purchase the Avalon handguards to go onto their personal builds or their uh, sleeper guns. Um, at least that's what I have seen locally. I don't know what other players demographically are going to do, but locally, that's what I'm noticing. One other note that you should know, and it's not really fitting within a pro or con, but it's something you should be aware of before you make a final decision on the Avalon series. During the winter months up here in Wisconsin, a majority of players are going to prefer to play indoors by like 98%. There's a couple of weirdos that play outdoors in the snow, but uh, those are few and far between up here. Most of the players like to play indoors. The problem up here is that a lot of indoor locations have a max velocity restriction of 350 feet per second measured with a 0.20 gram BB, regardless of the propellant system, and also are going to regulate the amount, uh, the weight of the BBs in order to kind of control the jewel creep, uh, jewel energy, stuff like that. So in that specific situation, we have seen a lot of players that will pick up the Avalon series to use as an indoor base guns. We saw via the chronograph test that this is not an indoor legal gun at all. So the fix to that is using the quick change spring system, which is technically, technically a quick change spring system. It is not quick at all though. You do have to disassemble the upper from the lower and you do have to disassemble the gearbox away from the lower receiver. Because of the ambidextrous switch that is here, that makes it very, very, difficult. I shouldn't say very, very difficult. It's very painstaking essentially is what it is in order to get access to your quick change spring guide rod. Now to get access to this, to change out your spring, you got to do all those steps. Take the stock M120 spring out, M130 spring, take that out, grab an M90 spring, hope that's going to be low enough based on that compression rating slide that in there, put it all back together, the gearbox into the lower receiver, the lower receiver onto the upper receiver, get it all back again, shooting in one fluid condition, chronograph test it, it's at 345 feet per second. But if you use an 11.1 .1 volt LiPo, 
that lower spring tension is going to result in semi-automatic being a two to three round burst. Just because everything internally is going to be super fluid and super easy to turn over with zero issue at all, that spring tension is not going to be enough to allow an 11.1 higher amperage battery to be safely usable on semi-automatic. So players have to get a 7.4 volt, which has a lower amperage output so that they can use semi-automatic and full auto somewhere safely indoors. Uh, probably not full auto. So players will need to get a 7.4 volt in order to run semi-automatic safely without damaging the internals and definitely without having a two to three round burst. So that is the fix to that. It is not a advantage or disadvantage. It's just one of those weird quirks that it's so good, it's bad. So it kind of fits in the middle, but just so you guys are aware, that is an issue that we have come across here in our demographic. So my suggestions for aftermarket upgrades, like I said before, is going to be upgrading the uh, piston head for a little bit better of components to get better consistency, better compression, which you just saw already stock. It's amazing. So you don't need to change it out. For me personally, I like to change it out as well as the wiring system that would normally come with a Tamiya. I would change that out to a Dean's. That's just me. And that is everything that I change on my VFC or Avalon spec of rifles. Now, I have about 50 of my personal rifles as Avalons or VFCs. That's going to be the Elite MP5 down here, the SIG MCX, and my first VFC is going to be this Mark 18. Now this is before the Mark 18s had the Avalon internals. So this is one of the VFC that was pre-built, not quite Avalon internals, but up there. This I had for multiple years, eventually turn it into an HPA system because this was my go-to rifle and I was so comfortable with it. I was like, gosh darn it, I gotta get used to HPA if I'm going to be using it. So into my most comfortable platform so I can use HPA. And that's been the best results for me to run HPA. SIG MCX, stock Avalon internals, and I'm using 11.1 volts in them, no issue. My MP5 Elite, which has Avalon internals as well, I'm using 7.4 volts because I'm using this indoors and because of that lower spring tension, gotta use 7.4 volts. But I am using a lithium ion so I can play for a whole weekend without any sort of issue. Super awesome. I have had zero issues thus far in the four years since picking up the Mark 18 zero issues in the two years that I've had the Elite MP5 and zero issues that I've had in the six months of getting the MCX. Now granted, I'm just one guy that has three different rifles. If you guys do have any sort of Avalon based rifles or VFC based rifles, put it down in the comment section below. Tell me what you guys think. I have seen from multiple other review sources on the internet, such as Reddit, YouTube, Instagram, stuff like that, of people absolutely loving the Avalon series. The issue is that I always see them compared to Crytax. And for me personally, I'm not a huge fan of Crytax. I've owned Crytax before, and I am saying that they are not that great. That is my very, very biased opinion. I'm 100 okay. I am 100% okay with stating that, that I have a biased opinion against them despite owning them and using them and running them as my primary before getting the VFC Mark 18. Gonna make that a point. So, put down in the comment section below, do you think I really should do a breakdown video of the Avalon series compared to the Crytac series? That is something that I probably should do, especially since I just brought the Crytac lineup in to the Airsoft headquarters, especially since I've been saying not so nice things about Crytacs for a while. But put down in the comment section below, would you want a biased or even unbiased opinion 
from a technician that has used and primaried Crytax and Avalon series rifles. Let me know, please. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Anyway, if you have any further questions about the Avalon series, put them down in the comment section below. Subscribe and like, please. That is going to help me out quite a lot. If you, uh, if you are interested in picking up the Avalon series, they are available here at the Airsoft Headquarters Superstore or on our website. We have them available there as well. As always, guys, thank you for staying to the end of the video. Stay safe, stay clean, stay positive. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.